Hi, I'm Jerry, and today I'm asking the question, who made the world's first manned, heavier-than-air flight? That's a good question. The simple answer is that no one knows. However, if I stuck to that answer, I wouldn't get a video out of it, would I? In the popular view, and possibly correctly, the Wright brothers made the first heavier-than-air, powered, and somewhat controlled flight on December 3, 1903 at the wonderfully named Kill Devil Hills, North Carolina in the United States. While a groundbreaking achievement, this was the culmination of a century of fairly furious experimentation in not just flight but powered flight. In fact, by the time they took to the air, all the elements required to do so had been around for a while. That is, as I keep saying, a subject for another video, although elements of the subject have popped up previously. I don't propose to go into the possibilities that they were not actually the first at this time, but in pushing back through history I have to give a nod to Gustav Weisskopf, also known as Gustav Whitehead. In 1901 and 1902, he claims to have achieved controlled powered flights, including flying in a 10 km circle. These achievements were generally accepted at the time, though largely dismissed subsequently. At the same time, the Wright brothers were in a race with Samuel Pierpoint Langley, who nine days before their success had attempted a power flight of his own that had failed. His construction is sometimes considered to be the first powered heavier-than-aircraft capable of flight, although this appellation might best be ascribed to a later version heavily modified by Glenn Curtis, which of course now means that the original was probably not capable of flight. It gets complicated, doesn't it? That's the beauty of history. It's never simple, and has enough convolutions to make even a casual researcher like myself question their sanity. To rescue myself from a digression and information creep, I shall restrain myself and continue to go down the rabbit hole. Keeping to the high points, we find ourselves between 1890 and 1900, and encounter the groundbreaking work of pioneers Otto Lilienthal and Octave Chanute, who demonstrated that gliding heavier-than-air craft were not only feasible, but practical. Lilienthal himself made around 2,000 gliding flights before dying in a crash. Chanute was too old to fly, but others flew his designs. Both of them contributed greatly to the Wright brothers through inspiration and active assistance, respectively, though Chanute was disapproving of their attempts to patent wing warping and subsequent legal actions because basically wing warping was public knowledge. So were ailerons, incidentally, having been patented in 1868, though that didn't stop the Wrights from suing Glenn Curtis over their use. Also around this time, man-carrying kites were demonstrated to be a practical proposition. Captain BFS Baden-Powell and his man-lifting kite first demonstrated to the British Army in 1894. This and follow-up flights were sufficiently impressive that the kites were deployed to South Africa for observation purposes in the Second Boer War. However, that war ended before they could be used. Nonetheless, the lifting capacity was impressive, capable of not only lifting a man into the air, but also heavy loads such as wireless antennae. We now enter an era that can best be described as steampunk. In 1890, experiments with steam-powered flight culminated in Clément Adair's uncontrolled powered hop into the air in the bat-winged monoplane École. This was, incidentally, the first time a heavier-than-air vehicle had taken off under its own power. It is differentiated from the Wright's first flight in that theirs was more or less controlled and Adair's was not. It will seem that there is now a bit of a jump between achievements, though this is more due to attempting to summarize a complex history rather than a lack of experimentation or even actual flight. The first full-sized aircraft to fly under its own power was the flash boiler steam-powered Dutemple monoplane. Designed by French naval officer Félix Dutemple de la Croix, it was, rather astonishingly, made of aluminium, and in 1874, after being launched into the air from a ramp, actually flew. 
Okay, it has been reported as staggering briefly into the air, but that counts, apparently. Steam engines and clockwork had been a mainstay of research into powered flight for about 30 years or so, which brings us to what is generally considered to be the first flight of a manned aircraft. Sometime around 1848, and demonstrating a palpable disregard for human life, Sir George Cayley somehow persuaded or coerced a ten-year-old boy into a glider of his design, and it flew. Cayley had been experimenting for around 40 years with models that demonstrated that heavier-than-aircraft were possible, and in the process established the rough outline of what we would consider to be a modern aeroplane. Following up his success with a lightweight and presumably terrified child, he went on to similarly terrify an adult, variously identified as either his coachman, footman or butler, who in 1853 flew across Brompton Dale in front of his home, Wydale Hall. To give you an idea of scale, think manor house rather than semi-detached residence. And there we have it, the first flight of a man heavier than aircraft. Ah, you might say, didn't Jerry start off by asking the question who made the world's first heavier-than-air flight? And didn't he mention man-carrying kites for some unknown and possibly out-of-context reason? Indeed I did. I will now skip through centuries of experimentation. Captain Baden-Powell was certainly not the first person to whom the idea of manned flight via kite had occurred. To anyone who has ever flown a kite, the amount of lift generated can be quite remarkable. It is no accident that many early aircraft designs resemble large box kites. A remarkable experimenter in the potential of kites was George Pocock, who in the early 19th century had been working with large kites. In 1824, using his daughter and son as test subjects, presumably with their willing assistance, he demonstrated that a kite could safely lift a human being into the air to the heights of 270 and 200 feet respectively. His son even descended from his flight via the kite line itself. This led Pocock to patent a kite-powered buggy in 1826. Impressively, three of these Chavalants made the 113-mile journey between Bristol and Marlborough, outpacing the mail coach in the process, at that time the fastest method of passenger transport. Reportedly capable of 20 miles an hour, this is an achievement made even more impressive by the terrible nature of the roads at the time. The kite, then, had potential, and Pocock speculated that it could be used to propel ships. Stories of man-lifting kites appear with some regularity in history. For example, in 16th century Japan, there is a story about outlaw hero Ishikawa Goemon perpetuating a theft using a man-lifting kite controlled by his accomplices. So the idea, at least, has been around for a long time. In 1282, Marco Polo reported that he had seen man-lifting kites in China. His description is detailed and quite plausible, and the nature of his encounter, the casual lifting of a drunken sailor into the air for the purposes of fortune-telling, clearly implies the technology was quite prevalent and possibly quite common. Kites and China are inextricably linked, with their invention possibly dating back two and a half to three thousand years. Examples of their use, apart from recreation, include communication, dissemination of propaganda, and even whistling kites. Given, as mentioned previously, the obvious lifting capability of such flying machines, it is entirely believable that someone considered lifting a person into the air with one, and it is entirely unlikely that it occurred by accident. Indeed, Chinese folklore has several stories of people deliberately using kites to lift people into the air. In 169 BCE, it is said that a kite was used for military reconnaissance. General Han Sin supposedly used one to determine how far his sappers would have to dig to let his forces enter a palace. I think it plausible, then, that the first occurrence of manned, heavier-than-air flight can be ascribed to an unknown Chinese person over 2,000 years ago. I hope you enjoyed this, and if you did, please like and subscribe.